Despite just a three-point difference on Metacritic, Fatal Frame 3, The Tormented, doesn't get nearly as much attention as Fatal Frame 2 does. And I think at least part of the reason for that is because of a phenomenon with series, where the more interrelated the series is, or the more any given title relies on the player having context from the previous titles, the less well-received it tends to be. Series like Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, or Persona get around this issue by having occasional callbacks to earlier games that reference events or tie up loose ends that can enhance the savvy player's experience, but also have a largely self-contained story in which not having that context won't confuse, frustrate, or otherwise alienate the new player. The Silent Hill trilogy is an example of the other side of the coin, where the second game in the series is the fan favorite, but those who have played the first game as well, myself included, tend to prefer the third game, because we get to see how the story and characters from the first game develop. Silent Hill 3 requires context to fully appreciate in a way that Silent Hill 2 doesn't. And when the context for the third game looks like this, well, it's not too hard to understand why the second game is so popular. Fatal Frame 3 is similar to the Silent Hill example, but it's quite possibly one of the most extreme cases of a game relying on the player having not only played the second game, but the first game as well in order to fully appreciate it. It's a case where if you don't know who these characters are and why they matter going in, I don't think you'll get a whole lot out of it other than its self-contained story. And that would be a shame, which is why you should absolutely watch the first two videos in this series before you watch this one. Because if real horror is the kind that really sticks with you, that chills you to the bone, then Fatal Frame 3 has it in spades. Atmospherically, Fatal Frame 3 takes fewer steps forward than Fatal Frame 2 did, but those that it does take I think are significant ones, and stick to the established philosophy of keeping what works and improving what doesn't. If the most improved element of the atmosphere in Fatal Frame 2 was the sound design and music, in Fatal Frame 3 it's the camera. From simple things like listening to tapes, which had previously been done in a menu, now being done in the protagonist's room with a visually interesting shot, to the addition of Dutch angles, these off-center shots which create a bit of unease and discomfort as well as mildly disorienting the player. And although they're used sparingly, there's actually quite a bit of variety, with the ones in the early game being quite subtle, and those later on being full-on proper tilt shots. The camera also sometimes slowly follows just behind the player, which is actually pretty unique, since it doesn't behave like a standard third-person over-the-shoulder camera where it's glued to the character, meaning that you sometimes have to wait for it to catch up as you round corners, which creates some moments of genuine tension and further taps into the feeling of something watching or in this case, following you. Although it's never said outright, I think the idea that the camera's behavior is at least partially contextualized is one of the coolest and really most unique elements of the series, and it's great to see it get even more attention in Fatal Frame 3. The setting this time is in many ways a return to the first game. We explore a single, sprawling, labyrinthine Japanese manor house with a separate but connected shrine, that also uses similar imagery from the first two games, crumbling architecture, partitioned off rooms, and mysterious shrines. So other than these claustrophobically narrow hallways, it's not terribly unique on the imagery front, at least as far as the Fatal Frame series is concerned. What makes it interesting, however, is that unlike the first game where every room has a clear purpose, this isn't always the case in Fatal Frame 3. And what I really appreciate is that this is actually explained, in that when there was a minor problem with the main ritual, the builders would need to build onto the house as part of a pacifying ritual. And so you end up with things like a well room, virtually identical back-to-back -back hallways, hidden rooms, and staircases that lead to nowhere, evoking a Winchester mystery house sort of feeling, which is not only eerie, but can be disorienting as well. What's also interesting about Fatal Frame 3's setting is the way it presents its set pieces. These rooms that make us pause and go, oh. In the first two games, these are all given context, either just before or just after it. We see the Kusabi walk toward this room dragging some guy, and then see the room, and it's pretty clear what went down. And by the time we actually see this dais in the first game, we know exactly what it's used for. So while it's still spooky when we do see it, we also understand it and that understanding removes a bit of the real horror. In Fatal Frame 3, we still get flashes of horror in the environments. People built into walls, cask of Amontillado style. The wooden figure room. The four shrines with dolls pinned to the walls. 
but they're things we don't get context for for either quite some time or in some cases not at all. It forgoes an explanation in favor of letting our imagination generate the horror, which I think many would agree is the best way to do horror. The manner in which these set pieces take place is also only part of the setting. The other part is Ray's completely normal house, which initially seems to exist for downtime, to give the player a break from the manor as well as allow them to check notes, read books, and try to piece together the story, and it does all this remarkably well. It's the only fatal frame where you're able to really form a routine. Wake up. Check your notes. Talk to Miku. Play with the cat. Develop photos, etc. But not long into the game, things start to get weird, and the spooky things we see in the manor start appearing in the house. And these house scares are just brilliant. You see something standing in the kitchen or an alcove, but when you ready the camera, it's not there. And usually it's just the one scare per night, or even a fake out like the cat in the closet. There's one night, however, where you get a spooky phone call that you think is the end of it, which is then followed by another three rapid fire scares. It's great stuff. The parallels to the Silent Hill series, what with switching between the real world and another world that slowly becomes the real world, are fairly clear, but as is Fatal Frame style, it takes it in a completely different direction. The thing about the manor is that as you play more, it becomes familiar, so you kind of know what to expect when you enter the manor. Builders, shrine maidens, the mom, etc. Whereas in the house, you have no idea what's around the corner. The sounds you start hearing could be anything, and whatever it is could be anywhere, leading to an interesting subversion of the Silent Hill formula, where although there's never any real combat in the house, you end up feeling safer and more comfortable in the nightmare where the ghosts are actively trying to kill you. In addition to the house scares, we also see the return of atmospheric scares from the second game, although not as many this time around, as well as more examples of encouraging the player to use the camera for exploration rather than exclusively combat. In almost every chapter, there are hidden ghosts lurking around that only make a sound until you find them with the camera. There's also a couple of environmental things you can't see without the camera, which I really like, because according to the lore, that's what these cameras are supposed to do yet, as I pointed out in the first video, has never really been the case in the actual game. I mean, even Pokemon Snap is more consistent with this. As for the sound design, I will say that the music is a bit of a downgrade from Fatal Frame 2, both in that there's recognizable music in the manner where you'll be spending most of your time and not much ambience at all. There's also never any real silence, which is kind of strange, seeing as how snow, which muffles sound and prevents it from carrying, is such a recurring visual. The house, however, is better for both music, as during the day there's a much more subdued track in the background, and at night it's silent, save the rain of course, and sound design, which is especially good in the house, because again, at night, you'll start to hear things. Just normal sounds, opening doors, footsteps, etc but they're sounds that you, the player, are definitely not making. It's super simple, but I think it's brilliant because they're relatable. Even if you've never experienced phantom sounds yourself, you've heard your friend tell you about the one time he heard footsteps in the hall but there was no one there, or heard the garage door shut by itself. It's a very simple, but also very subtle way to prime the player for the very real kind of horror that Fatal Frame 3 explores. That said though, with the exception of the house, I don't think the sound is as good as it is in Fatal Frame 2, but it's also not distracting the way it is in the original game. The death scream on the mom though? Top notch. <coughs> Ultimately, Fatal Frame 3 isn't so much a massive leap forward in quality that Fatal Frame 2 was, again, it's more a few steps forward, but they're steps in the right direction. Mechanically, Fatal Frame 3 is a sort of best of both worlds from the first two games. It returns to the system of charging energy from the first game which enables a range of potential base damage, adopts the Fatal Frame, Combo, and Lens mechanics from Fatal Frame 2, and also introduces mechanics unique to Fatal Frame 3 such as the dodge. The carrying over of the combo mechanic from Fatal Frame 2 means that the optimal strategy for every encounter is still chain Fatal Frames, 
but it's not the only way to fight, which is emphasized and encouraged with the addition of three playable characters, all of whom feel different from each other and have to use different strategies and unique mechanics to get through their respective sections. We spend most of the game with our protagonist, Ray, who is a sort of standard, middle-of-the-road character not much different mechanically from any other Fatal Frame protagonist. Her special ability is Flash, which is primarily used as a more reliable dodge with limited uses, but can also be used to instant kill weak ghosts, which can really only be utilized on a second playthrough. The second character we play as is Miku, the protagonist of the first game, who can deal massive single-shot damage, usually just one-shotting ghosts if her slow and double abilities are used in tandem, i.e. slowing a ghost, buying you more time to safely double the shot. I also like that both of her abilities require charging and that she can't use lenses. Cute throwbacks to the mechanics of the first game. The last playable character is Kay, who is much weaker than both Miku and Rei, which interestingly has cultural context, in that in Japan men are typically considered to be less sensitive to the paranormal, and therefore has to rely much more on combos and lenses to deal significant damage, similarly hearkening back to the mechanics of the second game. There's also a light stealth mechanic for K, where you have to hide or run from ghosts, but this really only lasts for the first 20 or so minutes of Hour 5 until you get a camera. After that, there's really no reason to use it. As for the ghosts, they're the best they have ever been. My absolute favorite change is that the ghosts generally don't get a cutscene introducing them, which can lead to some genuinely startling moments, like when this guy attacks you, and, more importantly, contributes to the return to very active combat. Ghosts in Fatal Frame 3 don't just stand there or slowly meander toward you, many of them are legitimately fast, and a lot of their normal patterns involve weaving in and out of your view. They actually maneuver, which is pretty cool. Admittedly, in the original game the environments are much bigger, and the ghosts will use them to maneuver around you, but their attacks are always straight shots. In Fatal Frame 3, the attacks themselves are maneuvers. Hair Lady dives at you. Priestesses lean to the side. These guys reel back, and the tougher ones duck. Even the first ghost you fight teleports slightly to the side as soon as you focus on her. Your ability to track the ghosts is the name of the game here, and it's made even more challenging with the more varied attack patterns, a tremendously welcome change from Fatal Frame 2 in which it's the same attack every single time. Here I was predicting him to do the same thing he did last time, and got punished for it. Later in the game they'll sometimes even fake you out, making prediction even more difficult. All of this is illustrated particularly well during the handful of fights against three enemies, where you're constantly maneuvering, positioning, evading, etc. Even more so than you are in the first game. It's fantastic fun, and really puts your skills to the test as well. The same complexity is true for the final boss of the game, who has a super fast air attack with a very small window of opportunity that also does a ton of damage, a ground attack during which she'll also use these blue orbs that don't do much damage but will knock you out of camera stance as well as stagger you for a potential follow-up, as well as a one-hit kill mode standard to Fatal Frame bosses that you simply have to run from. It's hands down the most complex final boss in the series, and it's wonderful. Miscellaneous nice touches include the filament now glowing red for everything except doors, which is good because it means that you initially can't tell whether what just set it off is a ghost that's trying to kill you or simply a photo op, granting a sense of tension every time it lights up. There's the pseudo fixed number of shots per trip inside the mansion, similar to what I suggested in the first video with regards to difficulty, and while you can get more as both the basic film and healing item respawn every night, with the exception of the higher tier films and healing items that you do pick up, of which there's a real scarcity for the record, your inventory also resets every night. Which I like, because it means that you can't accrue a huge reserve of items that you can then use to make certain fights trivial, and can also carry over into higher difficulties. There's also the particularly interesting change where the camera function allowing the player to see the ghost's health is kind of a secret requiring fighting a pretty tough optional ghost that can only be found starting at hour 9, around three-fourths of the way into the game. So, for the majority of the game, you can't actually see how much damage you're doing. This is quite different from the first two games in which you have this by default in the first game, and it's the first function you get in the second. 
Having this feedback and knowledge absent for most of the game shifts the focus of the combat so that it's less about numbers and efficiency where you're watching the health bar and swapping to lower tier film to conserve shots for example, and more about creating a truly visceral experience where simply making your shots count is what matters, which is even further enhanced by the previously mentioned variety in attacks as well as the much more detailed animations on the ghosts which we see up close and personal through the viewfinder. Ultimately taking the idea of Fatal Frame incorporating anticipation into its combat to its real pinnacle in Fatal Frame 3. All that said however, it's a shame that contextualizing the upgrade system seems to get worse with every installment of this franchise. Again, how do you upgrade a decades old supernatural camera? What's the process? Using what tools? And how do any of these 100% normal characters have even the slightest idea of how to do this? Worse still is the fact that the spirit stones from the previous game are absent in Fatal Frame 3, so the system that I could at least infer something from is just gone, and we're back to a Fatal Frame 1 situation where there's nothing to work with. But I guess that's okay if it means a return to very active, dynamic, enjoyable gameplay that's considerably more complex than the original game, and not nearly as repetitive and tedious as the second. Fatal Frame 3 primarily follows Rei Kurosawa, a freelance photographer who has recently lost her fiancé Yu in an accident. While on an assignment photographing a supposedly haunted house, however, she sees Yu and chases after him, in doing so falling under the curse of the Manor of Sleep, the alternate world version of the Kuze Shrine which, when the morbid ritual practice there failed, the shrine was sealed into a dream to prevent the rift from opening and releasing pain and sorrow into the world. Rei, Miku Hinasaki, the protagonist of the first game now working as Rei's assistant, and Kei Amakura, the uncle of Mio and Mayu from the second game, all explore the manor trying to find their loved ones and learning about the series of events leading up to the disaster that occurred at the shrine. In short, a priestess was chosen or would volunteer to perform the piercing of the soul ritual, in which she was tattooed head to toe with a pattern representing the pain and sorrow offered up by visitors to the shrine symbolically taking their pain onto herself. She would then sever her earthly ties and forsake her emotions by shattering a mirror into which she had channeled them, before finally being lulled into an eternal sleep by handmaidens and pinned to the ground deep within the shrine. Reika Kuze was the last priestess who, uniquely in Fatal Frame, actually completed the ritual. Her lover Kaname, however, snuck into the shrine with the help of a handmaiden in order to help Reika escape. However, the headmistress of the family learned of the plan and killed Kaname right in front of Reika just as she woke, causing her to lose control of the tattoos and trigger the unleashing, which ultimately led to the shrine being sealed into a dream through which Reika continues to wander, haunting those who have suffered loss like herself. Fatal Frame 3 sticks with notes, books, and tapes being the main mode of storytelling but does a much better job of contextualizing them. Rather than find pieces of a notebook and tapes scattered around a mansion or a village, you find notes and books all together on Yu's bookshelves, and Miku does research and brings you information and news clippings, while Kei sends the tapes. It all makes sense in the narrative, and it's perfect. Despite how well contextualized the information is, however, the actual backstory that I summarized earlier is more impenetrable than ever. Documents that would be definitive source material in the first two games are unreliable in the third often presented with mistakes or misinterpretation that will then be contradicted in later finds. It again taps into that feeling of uncertainty, of not having the whole story and how uncomfortable and scary that can be, which coincides with the cryptic visuals we see throughout the manor that we don't get context for, and culminates toward the end of the game where Kay misinterprets how to break the curse and pays the price for it. But as scary as all of that is, what makes Fatal Frame 3 really stand out to me is the kind of horror it explores. What Fatal Frame 2 touches on briefly in the conclusion, Fatal Frame 3 really examines, and in doing so it ties the entire series together in a way that other series can, frankly, only dream of. We see the return of characters from the previous games not just for cameo appearances or fan service, although there is a bit of that. Having trouble sleeping? Do you need to sleep in here with me? But with an overall thematic purpose. Fatal Frame 3 isn't so much about the spooks, spirits, and specters this time around, 
It's about the people left behind in the wake of a tragedy and the pain and fear that lingers for those survivors. And what makes Fatal Frame 3 really brilliant is how it manages to convey this idea through virtually every element of its design. The thing about trauma is that it changes people on a fundamental level, which is why I think the central visual metaphor of a tattoo, something painful and permanent, is a particularly apt one, especially compared to, like, ropes and butterflies. The tattoo curse itself also isn't a nebulous haunting delivered through hastily scrawled notes and vague folklore, but with a precise medical prognosis that shares many symptoms with post-traumatic stress disorder and depression. For example, recurring nightmares, which is why the setting is so important, as it takes place literally in the character's nightmares, and is also why the reused locations in the manor aren't simply a lazy rehash as some claim, but done with thematic purpose. Those of you who know the layout of Himuro Mansion know that the foyer does not lead to the fish tank room and the fish tank room does not lead to the dungeon. The same is true for the All Gods Village sections. The hearth room of the Kurosawa house does not lead to the hallway of the Osaka house. It's the memories that haunt these characters more than the ghosts they fight. Sufferers are also tormented by visual and auditory hallucinations, which are cleverly disguised in gameplay as the house scares especially those that we can't actually photograph or disappear as soon as we ready the camera, which furthermore serve to illustrate the thoughts and feelings dredged up by the manor infecting the character's waking lives. The last symptom is a decrease in waking hours, common of depression, which is also reflected in gameplay with how long the levels are. At first, the portions spent in the manor are very brief, lasting only minutes at a time, but they get longer and longer as the story goes on, Fatal Frame 3 is probably the longest title in the series, and I'm torn on this. Although the game can drag on and at points verge on fatiguing the player, I'm tempted to forgive it because it absolutely makes sense in the narrative. But it's the characters and their response to the scenario they're placed in that really steal the show here. Take Rey, for instance, who is haunted by the death of her fiancé, which wasn't just an accident, but an accident caused by Rey's careless driving. So, on top of how devastating the unexpected death of a loved one can be, it's also her fault. And over the course of the game, we watch her truly suffer through it in a poignant and at times uncomfortably realistic way. It's worth pointing out that Rey very rarely talks, and when she does, there's little of substance. She frequently just trails off, which admittedly is kind of annoying. Again though, I'm happy to forgive both it and the wooden delivery because in the context of a profoundly depressed young woman, it absolutely makes sense. The vast majority of Rey's characterization is actually done through exploring her house, where we learn that Rey is throwing herself into her work, that she's no longer comfortable taking pictures of people, that she's lost weight and doesn't leave the house much anymore. None of this is particularly subtle or deep, but it is believable and even relatable. From imagining that person is there, to being faced with the overwhelming task of sorting through their things, which Ray has understandably completely given up on. Not to mention, of course, having one of his work partners who doesn't know he's dead continue to carry on as if nothing happened. The Tormented really is a beautifully apt subtitle, contrary to what some seem to think. But Ray isn't the only one being tormented. In fact, I think one of the most terrifying parts of Fatal Frame 3 is Miku, because she's been in this same boat for a lot longer than Rei, and in a sense shows what's likely to happen to Rei if she continues to remain withdrawn. One of the best scenes to illustrate this is after Rei's first nightmare, where Miku seems on the verge of telling her something, because at this point she no doubt feels a connection to her, when Rei completely shuts her down. I just... Had a bad dream. It's heartbreaking to see because by reading the journal at the beginning of the game, we learn that Miku has never really talked about her brother, and this serves as the catalyst for her entire arc, in which we see her go from a cheerful and hardworking girl, as Ray describes her, to blanking out and muttering her brother's name. Like Ray, Miku too seems to throw herself into work, presumably doing anything she can to keep her mind off her brother cooking, cleaning, laundry, studying, DIY, on top of doing her job for Rei. 
Also like Rey, the contents of her room inform the character in some pretty poignant ways. Her bag is described as having a somber pattern for a girl not yet out of her teens. The face-down photo of Miku and her brother on her desk, which probably didn't just happen to fall over. Also, the fact that it's just face down and not put away entirely is not only similar to Rey being unable to put away used things, but also serves to illustrate this heartbreaking scene after hour 11 where Miku realizes that she needs to forget in order to move on with her life, but simultaneously can't because that would mean absolving herself of any responsibility and also forgetting about someone she loves, which she knows she can't do. Not to mention, of course, that Miku's reaction to being back in Himuro Mansion in her nightmares isn't abject terror, but exhaustion. This dream again. I thought I wasn't going to have it anymore. We even see the logical conclusion of this pattern of thinking in the character who makes herself most scarce in the game, Mio. It's hard to even consider Mio a character in the same way that Miku or Rei are. She's not a playable character the way she is in Fatal Frame 2, never acknowledges the player's presence or says anything reasonable, sensible, or rational. She's a lot like Yoshino Takigawa, who serves as our introduction to this haunting. Only with Mio, it's a character we know and care about, and to see her reduced to this shell of what she once was is nothing short of tragic. And even frustrating for some who irately but accurately point out that she's a total badass in Fatal Frame 2 and a damsel in distress in Fatal Frame 3. But the thing is that this complete destruction of her character absolutely makes sense as she's the most directly responsible for her particular trauma. She did involuntarily murder her sister after all. I would be a mess too. Mio is so far gone, in fact, that we don't even experience her trauma directly the way we do with Miku. We have to do it through a surrogate, and only get glimpses of what Mio herself is experiencing, which is just as terrifying. What these characters and Fatal Frame 3 as a whole show us is not just horror in terms of the supernatural, but what comes after horror as well. The lasting psychological damage, and with it the dread, helplessness, anxiety and despair that never really goes away. Fatal Frame 3 shows us that the experiences we crave from this genre don't have to involve ghosts or ghouls or vampires, that the most truly terrifying things could happen in our ordinary, everyday lives, and that real horror doesn't end when the credits roll. If anything, that's just the beginning. And that's genuinely terrifying. And it's horror that I've never seen explored in a video game or any other medium before, which is why Fatal Frame 3 is without a doubt one of the best horror games I've ever had the pleasure of playing. It needed two games not without their flaws to get there, but Fatal Frame absolutely followed through in a simultaneously beautiful and terrifying way with The Tormented. And that about wraps it up. You know, it's nice that a series knows when to end for a change, and on such a poignant note as well. Fatal Frame 3 really is something special. And with that, we can put this series to rest and... Oh. Right. Next time we'll be taking a look at Fatal Frame 4, Mask of the Lunar Eclipse. I'll see you then.